please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is as we move forward to uh, 1 Corinthians and as we've talked so often, even when we've talked in the book of Revelation, this is one of those chapters as you go through where a lot of times it, you know, it either could drive people out of the church or else it could drive people closer to the Lord. Because it's a topic that, quite frankly, people don't like to talk about. It's carnality. You know, they'll talk about how spiritual people are or how spiritual a pastor is or a singer or, or you know, but they don't want to deal with the carnality of a man. Uh, so far in chapter 1 and chapter 2, he's dealt with the unregenerated man. And, and then he also talked about the spiritual man, how they came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But now as he, he, he's been contrasting those, he's now going to be contrasting and speaking about moving from the spiritual man to a carnal man. As he's talking about believers who came to Christ. In fact, he'll deal with these situations in chapter 3 all the way to the end of the book. As he's, uh, as he's talking about the problems that they're having. In verse 1 we read, he says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but, uh, but as unto carnal, even as to babes in Christ. See, he wanted to speak to him about spiritual things, but he could not. You know, the, he couldn't at all because he says, but you're, but you're carnal. And so I think it's good for us to understand what this word to be carnal is. It's really the natural man or a man who's all possessive of his own thoughts of who he is. It, it's really that selfishness. Another word for carnality, you might look at a spiritual sense as I'm all absorbed thinking about myself and the things that I need rather than the things of Christ. I know a lot of over the years, and unfortunately I've seen, I've observed a lot of Christians who are in ministry, either from worship leaders or pastors or Sunday school teachers, that they know how to, on Sunday, how to turn a switch on where they seem to be so spiritual and they seem like they're, you know, like they got this Holy Ghost look on their face. But as soon as they, they leave the church grounds and they go behind closed doors like the Holy Ghost switch gets shut off and they go back to their carnality, their selfishness, and, and you find that they're, they're the ones who are drinking, they're the ones who are arguing, they're the ones who are carrying on. See, real Christianity, what Paul is talking about, is not played out necessarily in church. It certainly should be played out in church, but it's played out in real life. The Lord has called us to be spiritual, is to walk, is walk in the light in everything that we do. I believe it always starts at home. And then as that becomes our base, and then it moves to the body of Christ, to the church, then it also moves into the workplace. But as you see here, he says, he says, I could not talk to you as spiritual. You know, what, did, what was going on is they haven't grown up yet. They haven't developed. They haven't moved to spiritual maturity as of yet. Paul has been gone from Corinth some four years at this point. He hadn't been there. And he's getting word back of what, what they're doing there in the city of Corinth, the things that they're arguing about. And so he really just confronts them. As you listen and you, as you study the book of Corinthians, and, you know, I've heard other pastors where they go through it, it's almost they use this the, kind of the pastor or browbeat the, the sheep per se, like you need to get right with Christ. And it's almost like, you know, they're, they're the ones that are all, causing all the problems. And, and I always found out any times I'm pointing something at somebody else, I see the things coming back at me. I, I realize that and if I'm really honest with myself, I need to deal with my own carnality. I need to deal with that and allow the love of God, let the, the light of the gospel shine upon my heart. Why? So I can grow in Christ. I want to be more like Jesus. I don't want to settle for who I am today. And Paul, rather, if you look at this letter as a, a, a letter of condemning them, Rather, if you see that as really a, a pastor's heart, which Paul was, is trying to love them. 
and try to encourage them in the things he's, he's trying to say. Is, I wanted to speak to you about spiritual things, but I cannot because you're still dealing with the flesh. A beautiful chapter to read while you're going through Corinth, of course, is, is the, the book of uh, Romans chapter 7. Where I think really speaks about his own life. His own life as Paul, the apostle, as a Christian. And sometimes we think that while well, Peter was way up, you know, don't they make a statue of Peter and they put him on the top of cathedrals and Paul too? They put him, oh, he's St. Paul, right? He must be something else. Well, as we talked a couple of weeks ago, the Bible tells us that all of us are saints. Paul put on his boots just like we do. He struggled. In, in, in chapter 7, he, he talks about, he says, the things that I don't want to do, those are the things that I do. My carnal nature, I'm drawn back to my flesh. And so the question is, is how do you move from the, the carnal man into a spiritual man? As he, he goes and he moves at the end of uh, chapter 7, he finally declares, he says, who's going to deliver this man? You know, he said, oh, wretched man that I am. I never think of Paul that way, but he said, oh, wretched man that I am. Who can deliver me from this body of sin uh, as I'm trapped in this? Then he declares, oh, I thank God that Jesus Christ is able. And then he goes on, for there's no condemnation for those who, who live after the Spirit, who walk after the Spirit. So really the victory, what Paul is saying, is us living in the Spirit. It's each and every day by faith, seeking him and putting him first within our lives. And then when I find out that I do make a mistake and I do sin, I do what the Bible tells me to do. I confess my sins. And, and I go to the Lord, please forgive me. And, and the beautiful thing is you believe God's word. He says that he's like a, a faithful father that's able to forgive us and to cleanse us from all, right, all unrighteousness. We have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You know what, how that ends up, that verse? He says he's ever making intercession for us. The reason why he's, I believe that's written that way, because I need it. I need God's forgiveness each and every day. And as I come clean with God, I just then I just get going and I start walking in the Spirit. See, the Paul is trying to say, "Hey, I want you to enjoy the abundant life. I, I'm seeking that you can enjoy the spiritual life, but you have a few problems that you need to deal with." You know, over the years, especially in marriage counseling, one of the areas that I've dealt with and. My wife always had said, hey, one of your greatest talents is being a counselor. And I go, oh, is that right? She said, yeah, because you're re least willing to listen. And, and I, as I listen to them, I find that I point them to Jesus. And as I point them to the Lord, they do listen. In verse 2, as we read, read, he says, I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hereto you were not able to bear it. Neither uh, yet not a, uh, you're now are able. He says you're not able to bear it yet. Bear what? What's he talking about? The spiritual meat that God was wanting them to grow by. He says you're still dealing with the things of the flesh that you haven't gone to over yet. You haven't grown. You haven't developed. You still haven't, you know, you know, put on your boots per se. You're still dealing with the flesh. Back in Hebrews chapter 6, if you have a chance, you should read Hebrews chapter 6 over again, where Paul talks about where they hadn't laid aside the first principle, uh, principles of the doctrines of Christ, that being the repentance from de the dead. They're still dealing with, you know, repentance of dead, the laying on the hands, and he says they haven't really matured yet. They haven't grown up. They're still dealing with the first doctrines of, uh, of their life. And again, Paul is saying, you know what? Four years ago, we dealt with these issues, and you're still struggling with them. Verse 3 says, for you, for you are yet carnal. Do you see that? Like I said, most churches, a lot of individuals don't want to look at that. They, we have, like to think that we're on a, a certain pedestal where 
we're okay. Can you imagine all of a sudden you go to your mailbox tomorrow or nowadays, go to your emails or your instant, and you get a message. You know, oh, Paul the Apostle, I'm going to click on it, see what he has to say about me. And the first thing that you read, he says, for you are yet carnal. I go, come on, Paul, you're talking about somebody else, not me. But, you know, the thing is, is that when we humble ourselves and we realize that we are carnal, that we need to be change God starts doing that change within our heart pride keeps us from that change says for you are yet carnal for whereas there is among you envy strife and division are you not carnal and walk as men otherwise you walk as a natural guy he says that's what the world does he says haven't you been born again isn't there still jealousy and strife and division among you that's what i've been hearing what's going on there and he says it shouldn't be so and he's just uh, addressing those are the issues that were happening there in corinth and they were happening even amongst us even this day where there's strife and division are you not carnal and notice he says walk as men he's contrasting the life in the spirit compared to the life of the flesh the life of the spirit the life of the spirit does not seek its own even as we see it in a beautiful uh, later on as we get into chapter 13 where it says love seeks not its own but the life of the flesh is always about itself and he says for a while verse 4 for a while one says i am i am a paul and another says i am of apollo apollos are you not carnal what are we seeing here? It could be the first denomination the meeting or, or that he's talking about, where everybody's trying to line up who you belong to. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Calvary Chapel. I'm a, a Presbyterian. You know, I'm a Catholic. You know, I, you know, it's almost like that old story, who's on first or what's on second, and I don't care who's on third. And I think Paul's saying well, that's not what the issue. Do you remember in verse 2, of chapter 2 where I thought was really at the heart of Paul and what we're all about where he said I determined not to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ crucified Jesus our Messiah he says that's the only thing that I wanted to talk to you about that's the only thing I wanted to for you to talk about and the fact that he was crucified it is that redemption he says, but now you're talking about how good this guy is, how good that guy is. He says, that's carnal. And we have a tendency to look to men and try to follow after men instead of getting our eyes off of Jesus Christ. So Paul asked them a question in verse 5. Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. He says, these guys are just men. He says, God has gifted them to be uh, this marvelous instrument that the Lord has used. He says, even as the Lord has gave to every man, he, he's, again, directed it back to being God's business. The, to that church there, he says, it's the Lord's work. He says, I planted, I understand. In verse 6, Apollo watered, but God gave the increase you got to like this guy as he's directed it back to Jesus Christ. Later on, he says about the Lord, he says, if any man glory, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to glory in the Lord. And if any of us are going to give credit to anybody, Paul is saying, let's make sure we give the Lord the glory. So that then neither is the he that planteth anything, neither he that water, but God giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that water are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Paul's saying there wasn't a division between Apollos and I. You know, it wasn't that, you know, we're all trying to do the same thing. And a lot of times people want to take, uh, put divisions between brothers. You know, th you know, this guy's a better speaker than that guy. I think this guy, you know, he dresses really good and has great sayings. I'm going to go hear him. But aren't we all part of the body of Christ and trying to reach people to, of the Lord? 
I like to consider myself as a co-laborer. I want to labor amongst you. I don't want to labor with everybody that I come in contact that call upon the name of Jesus Christ that we're a part of the same work that the Lord is doing. As I mentioned this past Monday night, I went up to Pasadena to see Franklin Graham and to see Dennis. And um, as I walked on the property there at the Rose Bowl, they were out there on the lawn, a tear, I had to fight back a tear. Because I remembered in 1972, that goes back a few years ago, I was down in Palm Springs doing basically the same thing. There was the Angels baseball used to do their spring training off of Bob Hope Drive down there, and there was a large park down there. A bunch of us pulled a flatbed truck down there. We had the we had put up speakers. We had you know bands, and we had I forgot if it was Lonnie Frisbee or Mike McIntosh. It doesn't matter. But also there was this large group of people. We were there for one purpose: is that people would come know, know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. As I was there Monday night, I go look. My goodness. The Holy Spirit is still doing that work as we can co-labor with others and reaching them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul said, he says, don't divide us. We're, we're working together trying to reach people for the Lord. And he says, now he that planteth and, and he that water are one. Otherwise, we're working with one purpose. But every man shall receive his own reward according to what? His own labor being faithful to what God has given you to do. Today I was doing one of those works in the backyard. Maybe you guys know them quite well this time of year. It's called hoeing a bunch of weeds out of my yard. And I was thinking, I says, you know, I got to do the hoeing before I could do the planting, before there could be the watering, and before there could be anything that growing. There's parts that we all need to do. And every part of it is important. You say, well, Pastor Terry, maybe I don't do too much. I think you do as you pray, as you maybe you're the ones that get an opportunity to speak to somebody or, or to minister. We all have things that we do together because notice of verse nine, 9. So for we all labor what? <coughs> together with who? With God. It's not with you're laboring together with Agape Chapel. I hope you never, ever think that. I thank the Lord you're here. But can you picture that, that you're laboring with God? Laboring is a work in terms. As I was telling the guys earlier today, I was laboring with a wheelbarrow earlier, and one of the loads I had was 400 pounds I was trying to push on a wheelbarrow. By the end of the day, I only had 100 pounds in there because I was, my laboring was almost gone. But that's kind of the idea is that we're laboring with the Lord. And you know what? The thing is so beautiful. God's the one who carries the load. You know, the things that he gives us to do is joyous, is marvelous. He says, you are, notice the second part of verse 9. It says, you are God's husbandry. You are God's building. It's interesting here. As he's now talking about the church there at Corinth, the believers. And he gives us two different analogies to, to describe the church. One is a building. The other one is a garden. And I love it. And where he talks about us as his garden. You know, Jesus picked up about the garden throughout a lot of his teaching. And I'll just read one of them where he speaks about, he says, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Every branch in me that brings forth fruit, it, it, it's cultivated that it might bring what? More fruit. And he says, you're clean through my word. It's being part of the, that beautiful garden, how God gives us. And you know what? You, when you plant a garden, what are you hoping to get at the end of the time? You're hoping to harvest a fruit, isn't it? And the fruit that God was looking to have fellowship with us in the garden, all the way back to Adam and Eve, was ordered, was, really the purpose was is that we might have fellowship with him. And the fruit that the Lord wants us to bear, certainly we know as the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of love, the fruit of peace, the fruit of that beautiful fellowship that we have here. The second analogy that he gives us here, he says, you are God's building or, or, or the building of God. You know, and I, I love the fact that we are that build, build, beautiful building. 
But it, it's interesting, as he talks about the building of God, it, uh, as his notice of verse 10, he says, According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, another buildeth thereof, but let every man take heed how he build thereof. The, and this idea of being a, a wise master builder, there's an interesting Greek word in, in, in the original language which really talks about an architect. He says, otherwise, he says, I've been the designer, the one who builds, and I've laid the foundation. God's the one who's the master architect who designs the body of Christ. He says, Apollos of water, I've laid the foundation, and we need to build this beautiful building that God has given us to do. Later on, as we go into the book of Corinthians, he says, know ye not that you are, that you are what? The temple of the Holy Spirit. As we get further along, as he's laying this foundation, he says, not only you've been God's garden, that you are God's garden to bring forth fruit, he says, but you're God's house that God may dwell within you. Have you ever thought about that? That's an, I, I, I mean, it's one of those times that you think that the Lord would come and dwell in you, that he dwells in you. And as he says, but let's uh, let each one of you take heed how he builds on it. Otherwise, the, the foundation of the building is what? Is Jesus Christ, and he's the only foundation that we should build our house upon. Verse 11, he says, For other foundations can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He said, that's what it's all about. Hey, don't you love that Paul's bringing it back to being so simple? The real foundation of our faith is Jesus Christ. And again, as I said before, that Jesus Christ, Christ isn't his last name. It's really what it's been described throughout the whole Old Testament, that the Messiah, our Messiah, that Jesus is the one that we build everything upon. He says, which is Jesus Christ. Right, it's interesting nowadays, people like to build that foundation on other things. In fact, the, the, the amazing error I see that the Catholic Church says is that they build their faith or they build their foundation upon Peter. And really, if you take some time to read through Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 18, where Jesus was talking to his disciples about who do you men say that I am? Well, Peter comes out and he says, says unto him, and Peter said unto him, I'll read it to you, that you're the Messiah, the, the, the son of the living God. And Jesus said unto, unto him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. I say unto you that you are P Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so this, Jesus said to Peter, upon the rock, he will build the church. Of course, what he meant by the rock is very important for us to understand what he's talking about. And as you tie scripture with scripture, and what he's talking about right here, we understand it. In the latter part of verse 11, he says this foundation, which is Jesus Christ, that again, in the original language, and sometimes we lose its understanding as we just read our King James Bible, and that's why I think it's sometimes when we look at scriptures, we try to find out what it originally means. And with this idea upon this rock, there's two little words that you can find there. It is that first of all, Jesus said, you are Peter, or P Petros, or P-E-T-R-O-S, which simply means, hey, Peter, you're like a little pebble. You know, little pebbles, like you ever get a pebble in your shoe, you know, where it just kind of bothers you while you're walking around? He says, that's what you really are. He says, upon this rock is this word Petra, P-E-T-R-A. He says, this is that solid, massive rock, or maybe like El Capitan. Have you ever been up to Yosemite and you see this massive rock? He says, I will build my church. What is that massive rock that he's talking about? 
but it's confession that he said. He says that confession that Jesus, that Peter said, he says, Jesus, you are the Messiah. You are the one. You're the one that we've been waiting for, that the prophets spoke about, that we read about all the way from Genesis through Malachi. You're the one. And as upon that rock will lay that foundation, that great foundation. And so Paul declares here, no other foundation can any man lay that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. This is so important for us to understand. Paul deals with this, I think, in all the rest of his epistles that he writes. Because there were groups of people that were coming in to try to distort the truth of the gospel. And the gospel is this, that Jesus Christ came to fulfill all the prophecies, and even as we saw earlier, how he was crucified for us. And so they started adding to the grace of God. They started changing what the scriptures had to deal, deal with concerning Jesus Christ. And, and I would challenge you to read through the book of Galatians. And to understand the reason why he had to write that book, because they were became so foolish. They became so foolish, he finally says, I don't know what's, who got, what got in your head or who bewitched you. You started off in the spirit. You started off so well. In the book of Galatians, not only that, in the book of Ephesians, he sets it in order again. You started off so well, but who's bewitched you? That you're not believing the truth the truth of the gospel. In verse 12, and he says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, and precious, stone, uh, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. As we look at this building next week, we're going to continue to talk about these, not only the, the, these beautiful works that God would have us to do. And, and as I mentioned earlier, when as you deal with the world, word being carnal, you know, like people like to run from that. I pray as we go through the book of Corinth that our hearts be open, that we allow the light of the gospel to sh shed within our hearts and say, Lord, if there's carnality within my life, which there is, Lord, would you please expose it because I want to grow in you. He had to write this to a church. He had to write it to believers. And as we look at this book of Corinth, maybe we should instead of calling Corinth as we go through these epistles, that we would challenge ourselves and say, maybe it's to Agape Chapel. That we would be willing to be confronted by the Spirit. And if there's areas that we need to deal with in our lives, that we say, okay, Lord, here I am. Help me to grow. Help me to grow in my faith that I can be effective here upon this world. I don't want to walk as a carnal man. I don't want to, I want to walk as a spiritual man every day of my life. As I get older, I don't want to waste time. You know, I don't want to fly off the ha handle, be angered, you know, doing things that I shouldn't be doing. I want to be seeking to please the Lord in everything that I do. Why don't we go to the Lord and pray?